Well, it turns out that switching to microservices is not that easy without a plan and a process. So you need to keep watching to learn more about the migration process. A microservices-based architecture is beneficial due to its loosely coupled components that can be independently tested and deployed. In theory, the smaller and simpler a component is, the easier it is to maintain and deploy. And each independent service can be implemented in different languages and frameworks, so you can use the right tool for the particular job you're trying to do. Each component can be managed by a different team, reducing dependencies between teams. This clear boundary between services allows team to more easily design for failure, and it becomes easier to determine what to do if a service is down. But does this mean microservices are as perfect as a homemade souffle? Well, no. See, with monolithic platforms, every logical component can speak to every other component pretty much by default because they're all part of the same whole. But with microservices, even though each individual component is simpler and easier to manage, how those services work together to communicate and to behave as a system is more complicated and possibly slower due to the added network latency. Still, many, including Google has been doing this for many years, many believe that microservices are a big win overall for most organizations. But if you don't design your microservices correctly, you may end up with a distributed monolith. And that's even worse than the monolith you had in the first place. And it can take months to actually migrate. So we definitely know it's not going to be simple. But to help simplify that process, and because with any recipe, it's important to know what the end result is going to look like, let's map the path from a monolithic on-premise application to an application that's fully hosted on Google Cloud Platform and built with microservices. If you have already migrated your monolithic application as is into the cloud, then the same steps we discuss here can be applied to create microservices architectures. For most e-commerce platforms, the starting point is a monolithic application on-premises. Your platform will probably have load balancers to handle incoming requests from the web. These requests will be routed to your application servers. These application servers are responsible for processing the request by utilizing components like cache, database, search, etc. Additionally, your app servers may send requests to other backend systems. Obviously, this can't be fully representative of your current system, but it should serve as an example that's similar in theory to yours, so you can migrate it towards our target architecture. Now, let's talk about the end state, what we are trying to achieve. We definitely want to achieve the same functionality as Carter mentioned in the monolith, except now, instead of running a monolith, we would break that up into individual microservices running in portable deployable units of code called containers using Google Kubernetes Engine, a platform that handles scaling, hosting, and deploying containers. In this architecture, each microservice runs in its own containers and makes call to the backend system through a secure network connection. We are still routing internet traffic through a load balancer, but now the traffic is routed into separate microservices. This lets us update version of individual microservices while only minimally affecting the other services. And in our target architecture, the microservices may interact with a number of other GCP products. Cloud Storage, Cloud SQL, and Cloud PubSub are common GCP products for e-commerce applications. So Carter, how do we make this happen? One of the most important decisions you must make early during this migration is how to handle communication between the new microservices hosted on GKE and your legacy system on-premises. Since we're migrating in stages, there will be large periods of time where components of your platform will be living in both GKE and on-premises. Now, there are two main solutions, and they can coexist, API-based communication or communication based on a private network connection. In the API-based solution, you use an API management solution, such as Apigee, as a proxy between the two environments. This gives you a precise control over what portions of your legacy system you expose and how you expose them. It also lets you seamlessly refactor the implementation of an API, that is, moving from a legacy service to a microservice without impacting the consumers of the API. In a solution based on private connectivity, you connect your GCP and on-premise environments using a private network connection. The microservices communicate with your legacy system over this connection. You can set up IPsec-based VPN tunnels with Cloud VPN. For larger bandwidth, high availability, and low latency needs, Cloud Interconnect is a better option. Now, let's compare and contrast the two communication options. 
Compared to private connectivity, an API-based solution is implemented by the application teams and requires a greater integration with the legacy application from the get-go. So it is harder to set up, but provides more management options in the long run. On the other hand, a solution based on Cloud VPN or Cloud Interconnect will be implemented by a networking team and initially requires less integration with the legacy application. But it does not provide any added value in the long term. Now that we know more about these communication options, we can combine the two approaches and use them to our benefit. For example, we can use Apigee only for the public APIs in front of the microservice and legacy systems, but not between them and Cloud VPN or Cloud Internet for the communication between the microservice and legacy systems. This option combines the benefits of the two approaches, but is more complex to manage. One of the other choices we have to make when migrating is which GCP technologies to use. For example, do you want to use Cloud Bigtable to store data, or do you want to keep using some of your current technologies because they're still relevant to you or because the cost of moving them is too high? You should think about these choices as a part of the migration process. Here's the point. This is a complex process that won't happen overnight. So any planning you do beforehand, like how will my services communicate? How will I manage data? What should I migrate first? Any of this goes to help make sure the process goes smoothly. For more information about alternative migration approaches, check out the article written by Marco and Teo. Well, there you have it. If you are in the process of migrating a monolith to microservices, then you've got a small taste of the process here. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will be discussing the migration in stages. That's all for today on Get Cooking in Cloud. If you liked this video and would like to see more such content, don't forget to like and subscribe.